You're in charge now. All right. Thank you. Welcome. What he said. I don't know what he said. Did he, was he talking trash about me? Was he talking bad? I don't know. So I am also going to speak in English, but I am from Texas originally. So I might get a little Texan on you occasionally. So that may be tough for the translators, those that are listening to the... I thought about actually bringing the translation device out here, and then I could say a few words, and then I could just say it to you, whatever he said, right? But I don't know if that wouldn't, that wouldn't go so well. So today we're going to talk about uh, designing for mice and men. And the reason I give this topic is, you know, for so long we focused on the mouse and, uh, you know, the Windows interface, not just Microsoft Windows, but Windows in general. And now we have the ability to also, you know, use our fingers, our limbs. So it's mice and men, but it's also women too. I don't want to be sexist here. Um, designing for, for across the spectrum. So... I was at Netflix the last four years. I just left about a month ago and went to PayPal. Uh, much of the talk I'll give today will be uh, inspired by a lot of things we were doing at Netflix, and they are doing at Netflix. Uh, there I led the user interface engineering team. Um, at PayPal, I'm heading up all the web development for PayPal, and um, we're trying to change the way people think about money, which is a, rather than thinking about movies, now it's about money. So... Um, Netflix, for those that don't know, we're in Brazil now, and uh, they're in Brazil, I should say. So I still want to use the we because I was there so long. <clears throat> but um, it started as, you know, net, as DVDs by mail and had a single website. When I started in 2007, that was it. It was uh, when we would go to our leadership meetings, it was talking about the efficiency of shipping a disk to our customers. It was talking about breakage rates. Um, you know, uh, how many times you could turn a DVD and make money. So the whole economics was around uh, DVDs being shipped out through the Postal Service. And it was all the United States. It was all just in, within one country. Um, and, but it changed a whole lot <clears throat> in the last few years, uh, streaming on hundreds of devices. So quite a change we saw and we went through for those four years, going from DVD shipping a single website, to having to support uh, devices, um, you know, in many, many forms. When you look at this, this led to an explosion of, exper of experiences. <clears throat> when you have 400 t uh, different devices that your, uh, your experience is on top of, you know, and you did not develop most of those experiences or design most of those experiences. You gave them style guides, you influenced them, you gave them sample starter kits uh, to get a Genesis kind of going, but you did not own the experience. And this was something that uh, was definitely problematic for Netflix because Netflix <clears throat> has built its business on a very strong A-B testing, quantitative testing environment where we could field uh, many, many ideas and get them out within a, uh, a week or two, see what the results were. And we based those on some real clear business metrics, things like consumption. I mean, if you're going to have a successful movie business, you want to know that people are actually consuming, getting value out of your service. And what you really want to do in a subscription service is have people not quit on you, not cancel. You want them to keep letting the money go on their credit card or their financial card and keep having that happen. And that's really the bottom line business thing called retention. But you can't measure retention when you do something in the UI directly. So you have to have a proxy metric, something that stands in for that. And that is something like consumption. In the DVD world, that was easy. Well, it was, it was not so easy. I should, I should back it up. It actually was not easy because I would ship you a disk and you may a week or two weeks or three weeks later watch that. So what did we do on the website that actually influenced that? Well, the decision to actually put it in your queue, the list, the DVD uh, movie queue, <clears throat> was what we would measure. So the metric was really around adding to the DVD queue. Now in this new world, it became, uh, comes around people actually watching something, engaging, say for more than 15 minutes or some other metric. So we had this dilemma with so many different experiences. 
So what do you do? Well, so Netflix, you know, is known for valuing the user experience. It's something that we put a high commodity on. And <clears throat> if you don't do the experience, you don't own the experience, you can't uh, have that high quality. And we also believe strongly in A-B testing. Uh, believe that Agile is better than uh, the rigid firmware process. When you put something on a device, a Blu-ray player, a TV, uh, uh, Samsung doesn't want, by default, to have things change every couple of weeks. They want it to stay stable for six months, a year, two years. That's been their business forever. So there was also a big cultural shift to <coughs> get them to think beyond that and to think of more of an agile uh, experience. And then the ability to, to learn fast, fail quickly. For those of you that have been keeping score on Netflix, you may know of the Quickster uh, situation, the split and the unsplit of Netflix. Uh, we failed fast and learned quickly. <laughs> you know, Google's had to do the same thing, right, with uh, Buzz and Wave and other things like that. You, 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 you fell, fell fast and learned quickly. Now you have Plus. Much, much better iteration of it, right? Uh, I know Bradley Horwitz real well, so, yeah, so I have to give the, the props there. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah his boss, yeah. Um, so when you look at the experience across devices, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. <laughs> Can you translate that? <laughs> I've had this tickle in my throat. <sighs> what should I do? I just cover the mic. Um, when you look at the experience across devices that Netflix owns, there's a little more similarity and, and you know, more and more similarity will happen over time. Um, and the reason for this is you know, we're, of course, we're going across four different uh, channels, uh, web, tablet, mobile, and TV. And, but each of these has something in common. They have a browser technology <coughs> underneath them, and three of them have some form of web kit. On the TV, on the game consoles especially, and TVs, we're using both in, uh, Nokia's Qt web kit and Google's Skia web kit as a foundation, which allows us <coughs> to create an HTML5 experience across those channels. And that uh, is really beneficial because having a platform that we can push out across all these devices <coughs> that allows us to uh, then have very fast iterations of experimentation, uh, which is really, really powerful. But you know, when you look across devices, uh, things do change. There are different constraints. And so if you look at the web, you know, <coughs> we've got the mouse, uh, it's kind of really indirect if you think about it, you know, because you're not directly doing it. You have this other device. You have a keyboard. You don't have voice ne necessarily, although that's changing. Uh, and you have windows and controls instead of content. Um, so you have the input, navigation, posture, and display. On the TV, you know, we have left, right, up, down, you know, so you just got a real simple control. Again, that's changing over time with Microsoft's uh, 360 with the Connect, the voice user interface, the natural user interface with, with uh, Connect. But when you're trying to design right now for what the space is, you have these constraints. You know, a lot of it is pain-based, a lot of pains. Um, people's posture is lean back and relaxed and uh, much more in a media consumption mode. And the, and the resolution's high, as high, but it's far away. So you have to think about typography, making things big enough. Um, mobile resolution's high, but you know you're closer up, so you can you can have smaller fonts actually. Um, and then your gestures are, are input based as well as tablet. So when you think about input, navigation, posture, and display, those are the kind of the four areas that when you look across devices you have to think about the changes that happen in those different channels and those become your constraints when you're designing. And you know, I think constraints are really one of the most powerful things in the design world. Uh, if you're following Luke Rabluski's work, somebody in the States, uh, he has a book called uh, Mobile First and there's a whole movement around designing for mobile first. And really what it is is about embracing constraints first when you do design. You know, when you have, when you can do anything, um, it makes it a really challenging problem. But when you have some constraints, like in the mobile space, you've got a smaller display, you can have less features, uh, that's a good thing. At Netflix, you know, one of the things we talked a lot about was keeping as few features as possible in the interface. Um, 
somewhat you know, akin to what Google does too, you know, like trying to keep things pretty simple. We, we would call them barnacles. You know what a barnacle is? Uh, it's, you know, when on, top, on the bottom of a boat, when there's formation from the, I don't know what, what it's formed from, but it's, it gets hard, you know, and to scrape it off, you have to get like a chisel. And that's what features are like. When you get a feature in a product, trying to get rid of it is like getting this crew out there on the bottom of a boat or, uh, and begin to try to scrape off the barnacles, right? Uh, nobody wants to remove it. People have invested their careers in it. There's even groups maybe that support it in an organization. So we were pretty relentless about trying to get rid of features. Um, if you design for constraints first or mobile first or you know, TV and put those in mind, they force you to think about simplicity, which is a good thing. So choosing a portability layer was a luxury that I'm sure that not everyone in the room has, but you do have the capability to think about an HTML5 strategy uh, where you have a native app that wraps and some portions of the content especially can be pulled in through HTML5, shared with what you do on the web, and you can have some of the same markup shared. Although at Netflix, we didn't actually share the same markup because we were iterating so fast in all four channels that we didn't want to be constrained by having the same code base. Um, so just, just an interesting point there. Uh, designing for all four of these constraints. So there's two experiences I'll show you, and I won't comment too much on them. This was the first PS3 experience. It had a navigation on the left, a way to, to kind of go through the genres. And when it's pushed to the back and the contents up front, you can still see a ghosting of the, of the navigation uh, 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 mechanism. And then you can drill into the actual movie display information. And uh, we, so we're going to create one experience, right? That's all we had resources for. Um, however, if you have product managers, you know that's not a problem. Because they'll figure out a way to create 16 experiences. We actually created four experiences. <laughs> we only had resources for one, but we figured out a way to do four because our product managers were so insistent on why we needed these four different experiences. Any product managers in the room? Nobody will admit it? Ah, oh, one. Okay, therapy afterwards. Okay, yeah, we, we can, yeah. So, um, no, it was actually a good thing. Um, so we created four different experiences and, and some variations on each. It turned out to be 16 different tests. Um, the second experience, which was called Plus, a little bit simpler. You lose the navigation, though. Now you, you just have the content. We'll talk about a little bit later which one uh, actually won uh, and why. <clears throat> now, we could just kind of sit and look at the channels, these four different uh, inter devices, and say, wow, there's a lot of differences between the four. What will we do? Well, one of the good things is that what doesn't change across uh, channels or for anything you're designing is common design principles. Uh, the same design principles, when I got started in 1984, I'm dating myself, I wrote one of the first Macintosh games, a submarine simulation. Um, the design principles I used then are not any different than the design principles I use now. They're no different at all. Some of them have pithier names, you know, better names. Uh, some of them are more nuanced. The application of those have changed quite dramatically. When I was doing the game, uh, our submarine simulation for the Mac, and designing it, the challenge was this was one of the first games that actually used a mouse and icons and windows and menus, pull down menus. How do you create a game that's, you know, got great gameplay and uses that? It actually worked out really well. It was a, a fun experience. But there was no, there was really no prototypes to look at at the time. There were no examples that did that, which was, you know, actually made it uh, quite interesting, quite fun. But the design principles then are still, <coughs> still the design principles today. So I'll talk about three design principles. I could talk about probably ten, but I want to keep it short because right after me comes beer. <laughs> and, and if you stand in the way, I, I think I've learned this, between Brazilians and beer, you could get hurt. So uh, I don't want to be in that situation. So I'm going to try to, try to keep it uh, sweet and short. How about that? Three design principles. None of these are revolutionary, again. But getting physical, being much more about physicality. So 
That's my granddaughter. She's cute, isn't she? Say it. Say it. She's cute. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, appreciate that. Her name is Cassandra. She lives in Alaska. Her father's in Afghanistan right now. Um, but she was staying with us because her father was in Pakistan at the, uh, at the time. Funny story, the other day somebody asked her, where's your daddy at? And she says, in the other stand. So she didn't know which stand it was, Pakistan, Afghanistan, one of the stands. <clears throat> Got to love four-year-olds. So she loved this uh, game on the iPad called, or it's called Spin Art. And Spin Art, it's like a little spiral graph. It spins... And you can pick up the color, put your finger on one of the color palette, put it down, and it makes, you know, really cool, simple art. Um, and she just, I mean, that's all she wanted to do was play with spin art. On the iPod, the spin art, she would say. And then all of a sudden she got real quiet, and then she got upset. I said, what's wrong, Cassandra? And she came, and she had her finger, and she held it up, and she said, it's out of purple. She believed so strongly in the, in the physicality of that device that she thought her finger actually got purple on it. Right? So the next statement scared me. She said, can I have a marker? Can I have a pen, you know, a pen to... No, you can't do that on my iPad. <laughs> Here's paper. This is not paper. It may act like paper, but it's not really paper. So... You know, it's, it's quite interesting, the, the physicality, this illusion. And, you know, when I say the word illusion, a lot of times what we're creating in a user experience is really a user illusion, right? Because nothing we create is really real. It's all just bits and on the screen. And so it's like magic. In fact, if you want to have a fun um, kind of uh, study for yourself, uh, study magic principles. Read some of the old magic books. Uh, really some great, uh, great lessons to be learned uh, from that. Uh, from how to create an illusion, even how to, how, to, how to write a magic book where you have to explain illusions, which is quite interesting. <clears throat> so the Apple interface guideline, I think Mike is probably in the audience somewhere cringing from Microsoft. Um, whenever possible, add a realistic physical dimension to your application. So this is where it gets fun, because Mike spent a good bit of time preaching against metaphors, right? He told you how evil metaphor. He was trying to see... He didn't want you to think Microsoft was evil, so he started pointing out metaphors are evil. You get it? I told him, I said, if you want people to believe that Microsoft's not evil, you need to do like Google and just create a motto that says you're not, right? I mean, that'll take care of it. <laughs> Don't be evil. <laughs> he didn't buy that. <laughs> so I'll spend a little time uh, talking about some of the virtues of a metaphor, but I also agree with Mike, too, and I'll show you how that comes together. In fact, let's just say this. Yeah, I could agree with Mike. Let's just get rid of all metaphors. Let's get rid of windows. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so you can use metaphors, though, to embody physicality. Not this, though. So, you know, the Bob that uh, Mike talked about, it's really about, in that case, you're creating an artificial visual construction to support some idea you have. Sometimes we do a drag and drop. You know, we'll get excited about drag and drop, and we have to create these extra areas of the interface to drag things to or drag them out of, and when you could just click on the thing and be done with it, right? So um, I'm not talking about taking metaphors that far. I'm not talking about so much the visual aspect of the metaphor as I am the interaction of the physicality. On uh, Netflix, the Roku player, which was originally the Netflix player, it was going to be a device we actually were building it in-house, if you've seen the Roku player. Uh, it's kind of the most, uh, CNET rates it as the best device and others rate it as the best device out there. We spun them out of Netflix because we wanted to be a channel and not a hardware manufacturer. But we were trying to come up with what happens in a streaming environment when you're trying to get movies, you know, you're going to movie downloaded to you in real time. You don't want this experience of start and stop. And, and people are not going to just want to stay in one place in it where your stream's at. They're going to want to jump forward somewhere else. How do you do that? So we came up with this mechanism called trick play. 
And we take every movie that we, that we encoded, uh, every 10 seconds take a snapshot of the image and use that in a small thumbnail. Uh, two, uh, not two sizes, but one scale down. <clears throat> and you get this uh, effect where as you go through the scrub bar, you can see where you're going to land without having to download the rest of the, of the movie. Then once you do it, then the, it catches up within a couple of seconds or longer, depending on what your bandwidth is like. This is really nothing more than the film strip metaphor. You know, when you think about a film strip, you've got all the frames, and we sort of all understand that, and so it plays off of this kind of physicality of the real world. So this is where I say that, you know, metaphors in small selected areas can be very helpful. Playing off of something the user already knows is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Overdoing it and creating something that then creates a crazy experience is what Mike was talking about, um, is, I totally agree, is, is not, not the way we want to go. Now I'll use the one that he used, and I'll use it a different way. And this is a book, you know, the, uh, on the iBook on the iPad. Now, the animation flipping between the pages uh, in the book, I think, uh, you know, I, I kind of, I, I have this rule I call the cheesiness factor. In, in English, being cheesy is being kind of, uh, does somebody say, what's, what's the word in Portuguese for that? Do you know? Being cheesy? Yeah, Portuguese, what would it be? I hate these words like this because I don't know if everybody understands what cheesy means. It doesn't mean you're eating cheese. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's tired, it's old, it's kind of like not cool anymore, yeah. you know. It feels yeah. stale, it, you know, right. Holler it out. Brega. 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 Ah, <laughs> I spoke my first Portuguese. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> Are you tricking me? <laughs> I just cussed the audience out. I didn't know that. <laughs> so uh, so you know, what happens in these page flipping is I think that I feel like the iBook one's a little too slow. And usually, I'll talk about this a little later, but usually with animation, you know, we want something to animate. We're always making it too slow to begin with. And it gets to be cheesy about a year later. So the cheesiness factor is whatever you do for a special effect about a year from now, it's going to feel, what was the word again? Brega. Brega. It's going to feel brega, yeah. Um, but the physicality of this, it, you know it's a book, and you probably know you can flip the pages because it follows that physical metaphor. However, on the Kindle, <coughs> um, they have the same kind of, it's a book, you know, and, um, but you have this thing called a location. Now, some of the content now actually has page as the Kindle apps have, you know, progressed. This is changing. But for a long time, <coughs> you just had a location. And so you had this awkward thing, uh, what location are you on? <laughs> Instead of what page are you on, right? Now, you don't share, well, I'm on location 4255 of 5598. And on 5624, there was a really interesting comment. It's just, you know, it's too, it's, it's the implementation model and not the user's mental model of what a page is, right? So with, um, <coughs> with the iBook, they just recalculate what a page is based on your font size. Assuming that you'll probably settle into a certain font size, it'll adjust the pages, and that'll be your experience pretty much through the reading of the book. Kindle's newer um, page uh, implementation where they show page numbers on some of the content is based on the actual real page in the book. And if you flip 10 pages, you may be still on the same page in the physical book. Two different ways to kind of handle it. I don't know which one's the best. I have no data on that. But it's interesting that, you know, they, <laughs> they realized <coughs> they had to get past the uh, physical, the, the implementation model. You know, books have pages. Um, if you break the metaphor and put out an a, a, a implementation model, you know, then what happens is you've broken the user's experience cushion. The user has a cushion, you know, with the interface, and that cushion is some of the different um, magic illusions that we create in the experience. But if you go with strict physicality, like Mike was talking about, having to drive down the road to get to Internetville, um, that's going to be a problem, right? So we want to break the metaphor often with magic. You know, we can go back to the original page. We can say how far they are in a book. You can say you're here. You can go anywhere in just by, <laughs> just by tapping. Um, you can see how many pages are left in the chapter. 
these are all additional things that break the physical metaphor to create some acceleration in the interface so you can have a better experience. Strict physicality is hard work, uh, but magic can simplify things. You're reading a book, you know, it's a fantasy book, and the, and the hero's in trouble. What do you expect's going to happen? Some magic, right? Um, you don't want it to be strictly physical at that point. You want something to, to rescue the hero. This was an iOS 4. It's been fixed in iOS 5, but the calendar on the uh, iPad looks like a book. Has a page binding, has page depth, but and when you click somewhere on this tiny little bar at the bottom, it'll, it'll flip the page and get to there, but you can't actually flick the pages. Uh, totally broke the physical metaphor, which is totally unexpected. Now again, this was just fixed recently in iOS 5. Um, <clears throat> And it, it creates, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times on the calendar I bring it up and I try to flick. Even though I know I can't flick. Even though I, I've even given this talk, after giving the talk, I still want to flick the page, right? And I go, okay, what do I have to do? Oh, I have to hit that little tiny thing. What if I could use my little finger instead of this finger? I'm not as good as touch with this finger, though, you know. Um, and then it doesn't quite work right. <laughs> now, then we have an idiot thing like this. There's Justin Bieber. The whole world revolves around Justin Bieber. All right, okay. So watch as I, this is ABC News World app. Do you get it? ABC New, World News. World News. Get it? Get it? Okay, good. I, I, you're slow, but you're catching up, yeah. It's probably the translation. And then notice you have to scroll a long time to get back to Justin Bieber. Where's Justin? Come on. Okay. And then you can get seasick in the interface, too. So this is, a, this is what I call metaphors going wild. Uh, there's actually a video series that goes with that too, but um, for adults. Um, but you know what? Sometimes the best metaphor is just the content itself. You know, with, with Netflix, you know, what we discovered was making the content more and more uh, tangible and real itself uh, became, became the most successful experiences we had. Um, <clears throat> early on on the website, <coughs> we used to have a little a small box shot, lots of words around it, right? And then at one point we tested, we'll make the, take the words away. Didn't even change the box shot size. Box shot shot size. Um, but took the words away and put more content on the page. You know what? Con consumption went up. We actually retained more members. We had less cancels. Can you believe that? just from taking words away, right? Because it felt more like you had more content, a lot like the experience standing in a, in a movie rental store where you just see the, the boxes. You could hover over them and get a back-of-the-box experience and see what each movie title had. So simply contact, uh, con uh, content. Another is to use directness to simulate physicality. This was directness in 1984, uh, the scroll bar. And uh, I remember being very excited in 1984 when I got my Macintosh that I could scroll my code back and forth. It was just totally blew me away. I was, I was in nirvana land. I uh, loved it. Scroll bars, you know, still are controllers in much of our interfaces with the mouse, but in touch devices, they become indicators of where you're at. So they've gone through an evolution themselves. And if we're going from mouse to touch, you know, something as simple as the uh, Twitter app, which has a lot of great um, uh, interface ideas in it, uh, Everything is done within the application itself. You don't actually go somewhere else to do things, and uh, a lot of the management is much simpler. The second principle I want to talk about is maintaining flow. And what do I mean by flow? Flow is, there's a book called Flow, actually, I'd recommend, um, and it talks about the experience when you get mentally focused on something, how productive you become. So if you become, you know, if you're a runner and you run for a while, you know, there's a, what they call runner's glow. You know, everything starts, you start getting really focused. Uh, you know how time will pass really fast when you're in the middle of doing something and you don't realize all this time passed. That's what flow is. It's that very focused mental energy. And that's something that we don't often let our users get, get too deep into without messing it up. Um, game time, okay? I want you to uh, look at either screen. 
and you're going to have to spot the differences between two images. Okay? There's a flash between each one. Something changes between the two. Don't holler it out. And now, put your hand up if you're honest, please, and say if you see what it is. There's one, two, three. Wow, you know, usually I only get two or three. I guess the audiences in Brazil are much more intelligent than the rest of the world. I got six. <laughs> three times as intelligent, right? Right, yeah, don't, 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 don't say, don't say, don't say. I got somebody hand gesturing the answer. <laughs> now, I'm going to take that little, that little delay that was between the two images, the quarter of a second, uh, go to black, and then the next image. And let's see how many can spot the difference now. Ah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, just to show I'm honest, I'll go back. Okay, here we go. Now spot the difference. Uh-huh. There's still a couple of people going, I don't get it. No. It's the big engine. <laughs> so this is a phenomenon called change blindness. And change blindness, you know, your brain is wired in such a way that it expects things to be continuous and not, you know, interrupted. So here we have the web with the page refresh, right? And so we change something, refresh the page. Nobody can see the difference between the two, right? Um, this is what was so powerful about bringing Ajax-style technologies into the web space is that we could take away the page refresh. We could get around the change blindness effect. I think this is really important that a lot of people haven't really considered in designing pages that you know, we should, we should uh, remove it as much as possible. If you want uh, another fun study, just go to Google and uh, search for change blindness, especially on YouTube. You'll see a lot of fun videos of uh, tricks and experiments people have played using this phenomenon. So one of the strategies <coughs> to keeping the user in a flow is to reduce page switching, you know, because when we just saw that when we flipped the page on you, you couldn't see the difference between, or most of you couldn't see the difference in the pages. So, you know, we were going for a cinematic experience within, uh, you know, this PS3 <laughs> experience we called special. We wanted to also be able to keep the navigation so the user could navigate through the experience and then bring the content up and then let you focus on what, you, what you've clicked on. Um, and it follows good principles, you know, focus plus context, you know, simple navigation, users in control, those sort of things. And our product managers, you know, pushed us to do one more, or several more, but this one in particular called Plus. And notice what Plus does. Plus has no navigation at all for the genres. You can't, you know, you can't go search. You can't do any of those kind of things. All it shows you is content. And then when you click on content with the you know, OK button on your remote control, <laughs> for example, um, it does a page slide where it slides out a panel and lets you see the movie details and then further slides out to show the movie itself and you can start uh, watching it in place and then choose to actually make it your full experience. Um, so which one actually won? You know, because this, this, one, this one focuses on content being, you know, is the flow and the information's in context. And uh, we test these over, I don't know, six months or so. So this is the one that won, the simple one. Uh, and you'd think in qualitative and user, uh, usability testing, uh, people chose the first one, uh, special, because they wanted the, the ability to be able to navigate. <clears throat> but when we put it in A-B testing, this is the one that won. Uh, and what we have found out over and over at Netflix is that, especially in media consumption and media consumer style apps, People are lazy. <laughs> We're lazy. <laughs> when you're sitting on the sofa, you know, you, you really uh, don't want to think too hard. You know, there's, there's that great book called Don't Make Me Think. Well, it's, you could have the corollaries, Don't Make Me Work. Uh, we tried a lot of different experiments around movie choosing and movie choosing tools, and they would all seem to fail. Now, there's still a belief at Netflix, and I believe too, that there is a way to do it, and there's constant experimentation to get there. No one at Netflix believes this is the best experience. In fact, when we changed to this experience, where's the product manager again? Is he still in the room? Okay, yes. So you know what happened? Guess what happened when we changed the experience? Yes, they wanted the product manager's head on a pike. This was what the, one of the comments was, 
Can we have the product manager drag him out in the street, chop his head off, and put his head on a pike? That was how emotional people felt about the other experience, and they were so mad at the product manager, who's a great guy. You know, most product managers are, right? I mean, they're just awesome guys. Yeah. Um, but the data didn't lie. When, when we went to this, we actually saw uh, more people retaining as members. We saw more consumption, more movie discovery. Now, there's got to be a solution that puts the two together, and there's experimentation <coughs> going on that. Uh, these are other examples of staying in, the, in without switching the page. Twitter's we showed earlier. I think most of you are familiar with this. It was interesting <coughs> when I watched this, this little advertisement, this video, I discovered things I didn't know it did, like that. And with conversations, you could take two fingers and drag it open, which was interesting. Um, lots of different experiences to keep you within the app itself. So, uh, content, et cetera. Uh, this is a pattern called page slide, and it's, we saw it in our, the, the Netflix example that one where things could slide out. Um, the same thing we're seeing in the Facebook you know, app itself, on the iPad. Interesting, uh, the desktop Mac app, <coughs> I haven't checked it recently, but notice to tweet something, I have to click the drop down menu, and I have to say tweet, and then it pops up another menu. You have to ask yourself, why do you have to do that on a desktop app, right? Uh, is there any reason to have to have a right-click menu? Is there any reason to have to have a separate window pop up? Well, that's the way we do it on desktops, right? Well, you don't have to, right? I mean, I think people are becoming more accustomed to things being more interactive in place, and we could, they could probably do away with that. And there's kind of a theme here, I'll just say at the very end, where as we design across channels, we learn from these other channels and we start back applying it to the others, you know, like to the website and making things simpler or more cinematic. Uh, Twitter's a web app, you know, it <laughs> follows some of the same design principles where you got the page slide kind of concept where things are sliding in and out. Uh, and they're on the right hand side on a dedicated space. This is in contrast though to the previous Twitter version that used this concept of hover cards. There wasn't a dedicated space on the right. Instead, there was the hover, and things came up. Now, the hover can be very valuable, but this is an example of an anti-pattern called hover and cover, right? You hover up, and you cover essential information. It also can fall into another anti-pattern. Uh, these are things you shouldn't do, anti-pattern, anti uh, which is a mousetrap. So as you move your mouse around, all of a sudden things are popping up, and, you know, coming, coming up on you. Um, so, it was a great dilemma within Twitter when they were doing this, uh, chatting with some of the folks designing this, as they were designing it, how to handle this. And this was an interim solution until they got to the page slide uh, redesign. The last principle is just being responsive. And one of the ways you can be responsive is to create animations and transitions in the interface. So you give a little bit of feel that something's happening, moving you from one part to the next. Now, <clears throat> first let me talk about the abuse of this. Now, April the 15th doesn't mean the same thing. If I put this up in the United States, everybody immediately has a visceral reaction to me circling that date in April because that's the day our taxes are due. Ah, now I get a knowing recognition, right? Uh -huh. So it's a time to settle up with Uncle Sam uh, and pay the IRS. Um, so I was doing that using TurboTax. And in particular, I want you to pay attention to this area here. Um, and so I was experimenting with, if I bought a house, and had mortgage interest, so you can take off the interest for your mortgage on your house, your loan, and, uh, and it lowers your tax rate. Um, so I was playing around with, well, if I bought a house this next year, what would it do to my taxes? Now watch the number there in the left-hand corner. Stay focused on it. All right, you see what it did? I'll show it to you in slow motion. 10,000, 16,000, 98,000, 33,000, 53,000, 31, 14, 80, 39, 9. Why? Why did it do that? It, I had so many heart attacks all night long. I mean, every time I changed something, doing taxes, it was like midnight. I'm like, oh, my God, oh, $100,000. <laughs> Jeez, you know, don't do that to my heart. You know, it's, it's too gentle here. 
Somebody at TurboTax, I actually found out how it came about. It was a product manager. <laughs> it was a product manager. Yeah. <laughs> it's your day, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, insane. I think I, I guess I could see it on the refund side if I'm getting money back, but to to rub it in now, this may not translate so well here in Brazil. But there's a TV show this reminded me of in the states. It's called Biggest Loser, and the idea is they really 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 heavy people like 400 500 pounds 350 whatever. They go on the show and they go through a regimen and they lose weight throughout the time and most of them end up you know being really trim and slim at the very end. Um, but they get on the scale, and to create the drama, the scale goes up and down, up and down, until finally it lands. However, it's a better experience than Intuit TurboTax because it gives you the difference, at least, even though I think it's still silly, right? So these are examples of animation. Occam said this many, many years ago, <clears throat> 500, 600, 700 years ago, what can be done with less is done in vain with more. And Edward Tufte said, make all visual distinctions as subtle as possible, but still clear and effective. And we could do that with, interac with interaction too, with animation. Here's NASA.gov. They think that you have to animate menus. Can we never animate another menu, please? Okay. If you try real hard, you can get three of these down at once. That's the most I've been able to do, and I challenge you to get four. If you do, please send me something on Twitter or email and let me know. I've never been able to do it. There's no reason for this. This is, uh, this is unnecessary, needless animation. I call it needless fanfare. Um, I get it. When I click that, it drops down. I don't need the animation to show me that it happened. And Flex and Flash are some of the biggest offenders, right? Um, I had to do a, a, an example app for Adobe. Uh, I was consulting a year or so back and to showcase Flex 4. And we had this kind of tension between them wanting to put every animation trick in the, in the app and me wanting to like turn them down, you know. So um, this is Bear Paint, which is paint, uh, uh, a, a, a paint manufacturer. And everything has to be slow and slide up and have opacity you can see through and all this. This is not what animation is really meant to do because it comes front and center. I met a guy who does motion graphics at an L.A. bar. You can learn a lot in an L.A. bar in Los Angeles and a bar uh, when people get toasted enough. So he said to me that when he's doing commercials, um, he adjusts the luminance and the timing effects. When he gets done, he cuts it in half. He cuts it in half by 50 percent. Uh, he said that because when you get so focused on doing any kind of uh, effect, you overemphasize it and you kind of lose the larger scope. So that's been a good rule of thumb. And my co-author to my book says, and then cut it in half again, because she doesn't trust people who do, who put these effects in. <laughs> She's a little more cynical than I am, which is kind of hard, but she is. Um, so my snarky answer, I blame it on Flash, but it's really, you know, that we, we get captivated by these things and become cheesy later. And then animation, though, can be really good. It can reveal relationships. Um, it can improve the perception of responsiveness. Um, it can uh, show state change, you know, and it can focus your attention somewhere. It can create delight, and it can simulate physicality. So it actually has a lot of value. In touch devices, <coughs> you'll notice that an the animation is tied directly to the physical action you're doing, whereas in web style interfaces, often it's lagging to tell you something. Because, you know, it's your hand versus the mouse, the direct versus the indirect. And so I think we see a little less abuse on touch devices because we've got those things connected closer together. So TV experiences, you know, this is our TV experience, uh, most recent one at Netflix. And this was the Netflix site about six months ago. Um, and so you can see that. There's a good bit of white space. Notice, the, notice uh, all the white space in between here. The box shots aren't that big. There's a big area here uh, to let people rate something and get some uh, other suggestions back. <laughs> um, it doesn't feel as content-oriented, does it? 
learning from the TV experience, seeing how important it was to have really big box shots, to have the media be up in center, up front, uh, they begin to test <coughs> this experience, which basically goes a long way. It's like the Amazon homepage where you can scroll forever, right? And you just see content. And you can also go left or right. Um, and this tested much better than the previous website. Again, without having the TV experience to constrain and to think about design, this experience would have never come about on the, on the website. It was directly reflected from the learnings on the TV. And I think we'll see more and more of that. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, and you can see a bunch of information there. I'll make the PDF available also uh, to the conference. And uh, we can open up for questions. Whoops. Let's see. Thank you.